So, um, hello everyone. It's a pleasure to see you all again. We're very happy to be here today, resuming the second semester of our seminar topics in early modern studies. Before I introduce our speaker, I'd just like to give you the house rules. Please keep your microphones muted during the entire talk. After the presentation, we'll have time for questions. I'd ask you to either write your questions in the chat or use the raise your hand function to let us know that you'd like to speak, whichever you feel most comfortable with. When writing in the chat, please feel free to make your questions in English, Portuguese, Spanish or French. Finally, I would also like to remind you that this session is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel later. Having that said, we're happy to welcome today Professor Ananya Chakravarti. Professor Chakravarti obtained her PhD at the University of Chicago and is currently an associate professor in the Department of History in the Georgetown College in, the, in Georgetown University. Her research interests involve the early modern South Asian history, the Portuguese Empire, colonial Brazil, global history, the history of religion, and the history of emotions. She is the author of The Empire of Apostles, Religion, Accommodatio, and the Imagination in, of Empire in the Early Modern Brazil and India. Today, she will present a paper titled Swimming in Other Waters, Slavery Between the Atlantic Historiography and South Asian History, which we're all very lo looking forward to hear. So thank you, Professor Chakravarti, for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Every, everything clear? Okay. Um, I just wanted to thank you, uh, Veronica and Livia so much for inviting me. I'm really honored to be here. This is work that's uh, at least three years of my making. <laughs> so, um, and uh, you, you guys are hearing it first. <laughs> Um, uh, it's, it's really it's really exciting to share this with you. Um, and so I, while the paper on which this is based actually has a very long historiographical excursus sort of explaining um, a lot of the development of Brazilian historiography, given this audience, I'm actually not going to focus too much on that because my hope is actually South Asian. Um, South Asianists to learn more about that historiography in the final published paper. Um, but my goal is to eventually, um, um, you know, uh, really focus especially on the, the immense richness of the archive that I've worked on. Um, and I should mention, I will have references to ethnography that I did. This is the first project in which I also did ethnography as an early modernist. Um, and I hope it'll be clear what the ethnography did in terms of helping me to read and understand this archive better. Um, so that being said, uh, could we go to the next slide or do I have the, yeah, perfect. So, um, if we talk about South Asian slavery, I mean, um, the, uh, the 2016 index of global slavery, um, by far the single biggest region, um, of the, of, uh, modern slavery is South Asia. So the countries of India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, in, um, in, um, 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 made up the top, um, made up the top, off the top five countries, like those three heavy, uh, figure most heavily. And yet, what's interesting about that is the fact that um, we there's relatively little attention to the history of slavery in the historiography of South Asia. Um, so, if we can uh, move to the next slide. So part of the um, part of that is it's um, there's a, there's a very um, sort of interesting kind of view of um, uh, and in the historiography that there is on South Asian slavery there is a kind of constant need to assert how different it is from the Atlantic world and it's become almost a kind of trope like if you read most of the modern literature on it there's this need to say okay this is you know this is really different this is totally different from the atlantic world um, as someone who actually works on brazil um that got me thinking because some of the ways in which this this assumption is made just doesn't sound like the historiography i know so um when i started to kind of think through the ways in which south asianists tend to characterize Atlantic world slavery, it's, it's, it's quite outmoded. So there's this idea that what is at the heart of Atlantic slavery is this teleological movement from slavery to freedom, which, you know, I mean, if you, you can go back to like, um, 
Carter Woodson. And I think that there's a good case to be made that Atlantic slavery has, has moved away from that teleology. Um, uh, in the case of Brazil, I mean, if that if that idea was there in, in someone like Gilberto Freire, like for, from the 60s onwards, uh, starting with Amdeus de Nascimento or, um, uh, or, you know, Florestan Fernandes, uh, like that idea is just dead. Um, and so, and also this kind of focus on the fact that the, the primary, the, the sort of the overwhelming importance of chattel slavery in the Atlantic world means that in, in South Asia, where that was by no means the primary mode of forced labor extraction, it means that there is like there's, um, this, this um, gulf that makes it impossible to really draw any serious insights. Now, I think part of that instinct I agree with, which is to basically resist a kind of Eurocentric need to sort of past the Anglo um, US sphere almost as this kind of, um, you know, the, the universal so that all experiences can are only to be, you know, sort of judged against um, that sort of standard. Um, so I understand that, but I think that there is really insight, insights to be learned from Atlantic historiography for South Asian historians of slavery. And, and that's really sort of the, the goal for me today. Um, is, is, just, is, to, is to show how thinking like a Brazilianist has helped me kind of think through the problem of slavery in South Asia. Um, so if we can go to the next slide. So um, of the most um, recent kind of um, works on slavery, and again, I don't want to say that this is, you know, that there isn't really fantastic work on slavery. I mean, it's here especially, I think the, the work that Nira Victor Masenga has done on slavery in, slave, uh, in Sri Lanka recently, and in fact, the entire team of Dutch colonial historians who are beginning to really seriously work on slavery through the Dutch archives is producing superb work. Um, and, you know, there, there are important historians of slavery working even today, like Shada Bano and, and on medieval good track. Um, so there's lots of good work. And of course, there was in the earlier subaltern school, um, I'm thinking especially of the landmark work of Gyan Prakash, and, and especially more recently, the work of Rupa Vishwanath and, and Sonal Mohan, um, and really thinking about this, this problem of um, slavery in South Asian history. So I, I'm drawing on a, a very rich body of research in South Asia itself, but my, my contention is that, the, that at best, it is a small subfield. Whereas I think that what we really should be moving is to something like what happened in Brazilian historiography, where slavery became central um, to understanding every type of social, social process. So here is Richard Eaton gives us, um, I think, the, uh, a really capacious definition of slavery that moves away from this idea of the, of, again, he also makes a strong claim that South Asia is not like the Atlantic world because it's not just chattel slavery and there is no teleology to how slavery goes to freedom. Um, and so he gives us this definition of the condition of uprooted outsiders, impoverished insiders, or the descendants of either serving persons or institutions on which they are wholly dependent. Um, and and it, 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 for South Asian, it's like, of course, the, the advantage of this is that there is the ability, there is the possibility of capturing caste um, in this, as well as um, domestic sexual slavery and other other modes of slavery, including sort of Islamic military slavery. So it's the capaciousness which is very in, um, um, attractive to a South Asianist. But for someone who works from, you know, who also works on Brazilian history, the absolute lack of reference to forced labor is glaring. <laughs> the, the complete absence of labor in that definition was the first thing that kind of stuck out at me. Um, and so I think that is because in South Asia, the, South Asia still hasn't made the move that Brazil did, Brazil did in terms of thinking about slavery, not as a kind of narrowly defined mode of production, um, or even one um, in which the, you know, the relation of of, of between enslaved people and slaveholders is one of violent domination alone. Um, and so this, this, this is really, I think, what Eaton is moving away from. But I think if we actually, we must center labor in definitions of slavery in South Asia. And so despite what seems like a kind of multifarious forms and, uh, and you know, this kind of wide typology of, um, of, um, of forms of slavery, the, the control of labor, including sexual labor, was central to all of these um, institutional arrangements. Um, so if we go to the next slide. 
Um, so as I said, for this audience, I'm not going to kind of go through the, the, the long arc of Brazilian historiography, especially um, that, 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 that sort of gives lie to this outmoded idea within South Asian history of what Atlantic slavery looks or Atlantic historiography of slavery is. Um, but um, I think that the biggest thing is that, of course, like what we, what we learn from Brazilian historiography is, is to really kind of not look at this, um, uh, to, to really look at slavery as central to all these different kinds of social processes. And so for me, the, the best way for scholars of South Asia is like Marcia de Sousa, Swadesh is a um, um, view that enslavement, trafficking, slavery, and manumission are different points of the same process of the institutionalization of slavery. And so then the same person can transit from being rendered an absolute social outsider, which is at the point of um, enslavement, um, to becoming essentially a full member of society, um, but always, always marked as freed, right? Um, and through, it's the, through this process of what he calls liminal incorporation, right? Um, if you can go to the next slide. So Suarez's approach actually covers the capaciousness of Eaton's definition. Um, but what's, what, what it does is where Eaton's definition is almost typological, what Suarez gives us is a way of thinking about this in terms of like, it's a dynamic and a reversible process. So the same person can go from say, you know, being trafficked to being manumitted to actually being re-enslaved in some way, right? And that that reversibility and that dynamism of the process is what Eaton's definition can't give us, which for historians is obviously problematic. Um, moreover, the other thing that is really important in, in, in the way in which Swartz thinks about it is, of course, because of the focus on the institutionalization of slavery and the, and the, in, um, the, the role of the state is key. Now, if you look at the sort of the pioneering, pioneering work of Hir, uh, Hiroshi Fukuzawa on, medie on the medieval Deccan, he points this out too. Like, so for example, from the Peshwa Daftar, um, the Maratha Daftar, so you can tell not only was the state itself actively enslaving people and selling slaves um, itself, but it was actually crucial in sort of um, maintaining and, um, and, and adjudicating the entire process of enslavement. And it derived actually both resources as well as legitimacy from its role in this process, right? Um, so the state's role is key to scrutinize, but also it, by, by thinking about the institutionalization, that means that we have to also pay attention, and this is something that Brazilian historiography has done really well, is to look at the ways in which elite modes of classification and the concomitant process of identity formation work together so that these bureaucratic labels of like, you know, um, of ethnicity, of race and other kinds of ways in which people were marked um, was not just one of the ways in which slavery becomes institutionalized, but it's also one of the ways in which identity is formed. Um, so for South Asia, taking these lessons is, 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 is really important, but also it means that then we can center slavery in really thinking about all manner of social processes. And so to some extent, this is the kind of approach I'm trying to make um, here. Um, can you go to the next one? The other thing, like if, if thinking about, again, I wanna point out that there are already sort of really interesting um, 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 uh, things happening in South Asian historiography that I'm um, working on. And so Indrani Chatterjee's intuition on this, um, it really kind of comes off of that larger point about this, you know, that, that we must sort of, we must be really careful with the ways in which we take sort of elite, um, 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 you know, boundary making um, and, and historicize that itself. So as she says, uh, um, you know, that, that looking at slavery would de demystify later colonial South Asian histories and situating them in terms of their larger global connection in modes that are unsettling for subtle geographic boundaries of the region. Furthermore, slavery presents a major challenge to the unexamined modes of ethnic identification upon which historians routinely rely to trace their histories. As she puts it, when Genoese 
these slaves turn out to be Russian, it follows that historical slavery studies of slavery in South Asian societies too have to rethink boundary making itself as an historical process. Now, while she's focusing on ethnicity, I actually think that this is actually just as true of race and caste and blackness and even how we think about regions in South Asian history. And that's what I'm going to try to show today. We can go to the next one. So the region, this, the, this is one of the things that I'm working on. So um, uh, why is it, why am I looking at this West Coast? Like, why not just go, uh, why am I going all the way down to the Konkan? In fact, like the new book that I'm writing was, is, is, is a history of this, of this swath of the Western coast. And part of it is to actually think about, well, why are our modern intuitions about region? Um, maybe not the best way of thinking about what actually lived historical experience um, shows us. So the Konkan Railway today, which is probably the way that most people think about it, um, is, you know, it sort of goes just south of Goa and just, you know, south of Bombay, like that, that, that sway. Um, the only book of a history of the Konkan, which was written by a British um, um, reverend and administrator in the early 20th century, he defines it as, as actually not even including the Goa bit <laughs> because of this British colonial um, period. And, and you know, the, 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 the thing is that mo even today, nobody would include Kerala um, as part of any working definition of the Konkan. So why am I saying Kerala as well, right? Why would I actually think that it's important to, um, to include <laughs> um, this, right? Um, and so here, the, there's a copper plate here that um, you can see um, that, will, uh, that, I, that, that I hope will kind of uh, show you why that there's actually a much longer genealogy of this connected region. And one of the ways that we can actually trace that, that, that genealogy is to actually think about the uh, history of slavery carefully. So if we go to the next slide. So the connection between Kerala and the Konkan is old. Um, and it is, a, it is a one that is actually, uh, which is really important for understanding the structure of slavery because of the country coastal trade that, that really connects this region and which was also crucial to the, um, to, to, the, to the trade in people as well, right? So the, so the 15th century Malayalam um, ballad, an unusual ballad because it's actually written by the mercantile Chepiar caste. Um, and, and the stories about this father who kind of uh, really trying to prevent his son from leaving. Um, and when his son sort of goes on this quest that his father thinks is doomed, he basically gives him this advice to take advantage of this coastal mercantile network. Um, and he says, you know, for so long I've prohibited you from going in vain as you go so far as of seeking death, you must have companions with you. For your sake, join the four trade associations, our alliances, the chief Goa merchant, um, and the Anjavanam, the Manigramam, and our people. So these are these are uh, these are uh, medieval guilds, um, trading guilds, and so it's like you can see that these kind of connections across the coast of guilds, of traders, of task networks already existed long before the uh, the Portuguese get there. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind next is that that legacy is right there. So this, so when I did field work in Hochi, this is the, the temple of the Chetiar, the Konkani Chetiar community in Kochi. Um, it's much lesser known and they're quite, uh, <laughs> there's a lot of resentment that what they consider the later ones that they claim their, their temple is older. They, they claim that it goes back to the 15th century. Um, and it might very well be true. Um, so if you can next try it slide. Um, and, you know, so, uh, but, and they also maintain connections all the way, not just uh, to Goa, but into the, the uh, into the Deccan. So, you know, when I was doing this work, like, you know, there, there was a, they had, uh, they had a um, festival where they had nonstop singing for three days and they had brought in, you know, religious singing groups for Kirtans from Mar Maharashtra uh, as well. So these regional connections continue if you go further. What was amazing is that inside the home of one of these, uh, of a member of the Konkani Chakir community, they still have what are called these um, uh, Kula Devatas. So they're, they're lineage deities that they claim that they brought from Goa 
um, way before. Um, and this one was actually, it actually doesn't live in the house of the original family because the, that man, the current scion of that house is a communist and he doesn't believe in the stuff. So another neighbor has taken it over and put it in their house for safekeeping, right? Um, so if you go forward, um, so, and so if these connections existed before the arrival of the Portuguese, then slavery also existed in this region before the arrival of the Portuguese. So in Kerala itself, for example, there's a property deed, a property transfer deed, which included the, the, the uh, transfer of people along with uh, goods. So there was, there was clearly forms of slavery that looked like chattel slavery. What's even more disturbing is that the power of um, uh, slaveholders over, over enslaved people was nearly absolute. So a uh, sale deed from 1591 essentially gives the right to the slave owner to, to, um, to murder um, uh, enslaved people uh, as long as that verdict was sanctioned by the local sovereign. So if you move forward. When um, and when the Portuguese get there, they actually worry about it. When the Europeans finally get there, they're actually worrying about like these local customs and their own increasing involvement in them, right? So um, the Jesuit Nicola Lancilato writes to Ignatius from Colum, basically, you know, saying, "Is it okay? Like, should we be involved in this?" And especially, he's especially worried about the fact that the you know that they're um, they're they're enslaving people in the uh, and basically saying, oh, it's good because we'll convert them. And he's like, is this okay? Like, oh, what are we getting involved in? And what's interesting in this very long letter, um, he also gives us, you know, the, the ways in which this is working, that there's a lot of sort of self-sale going on. People are selling their, their family members and it's happening, really it's driven by hunger. They're seasonal and, you know, like sort of famine related cycles to this. Um, and there's tons of sexual slavery and which the Portuguese apparently have adopted completely, right? So if you go further. So um, these connections actually then become stronger once the Portuguese get there. So one of the most interesting things is around the middle of the 16th century, when the Portuguese start to make it impossible, especially for Brahmin groups to um, to maintain their um, their hold uh, their land holding without converting, a group of them actually then come back come down to Kochi. So this is the the this is the Jesuit in Kochi actually complaining about these guys who have just showed up and who are who you know he describes as robbers and they're doing all kinds of things. One of the things that you know there's a big scandal in this period because they're supposedly sort of instigating the slaves not to listen to the Portuguese and to and so so the the arrival of these groups from Goa of Brahmins who have come down to Kochi is 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 something that's actually connect, strengthening these connections. So if you go next um, and, and we can see that there's an entire coastal network. I'm just giving you a, a one example of this, but I have tons of documentation, including like legal records and things like that. Um, so there's a very strong network of, of ports that connect from Kochi all the way to Goa, which is really how this coastal uh, uh, trade is structured as well. So if you go down. Um, this is the Brahmins <laughs> in Kochi today. So this is actually the most famous temple, um, the, the, the Tirumala Devaswam. And so the, the, this is the one that the, the Chetiers resent because they think that this is a, you know, Johnny come lately compared to their temple, but this is the one that gets all the attention. Um, it's, it's been the site of a lot of controversy, which, you know, is part of the work that I'm doing, including fights with the Portuguese, fight with the, fights with the Dutch, fights with the Kochi king, like all this stuff. So, if you go further. Again, this was, uh, you know, we can see how these, these connections are also maintained sort of religiously. This was a scriptural reading that was happening. The whole thing was actually the person doing the reading was reading in Marathi and then translating in Konkani. So this is happening in Kerala, right? Um, and so the next one. And this is the most interesting. This is a sort of small regional temple. Um, this is something that you would never see in Goa because what it is is a collection of all of the different lineage deities in one complex. 
usually in Goa, they would be in different villages. But because of the difficulty of sort of going up to Goa before the arrival of the railways, because the landscape is essentially cut by rivers, so it's very hard unless you go through the, the sea. And so basically in the 1970s with the introduction of barge uh, uh, trawler fishing, the local um, lo sort of uh, shipping uh, and coastal transport networks were, were disrupted. So it became very difficult to make the pilgrimage to your ancestral village to pay uh, homage uh, to, to worship your lineage deity. So they basically built this complex so they could continue to worship without having to go to their villages. But it's a fascinating sort of um, telescoping of the landscape of Goa into one temple complex. So if you go further. What is interesting is that even though the, the other group that I actually did um, field work in, and we don't have re written records about them in the same way, but they show up everywhere. If you start to look at the history of slavery, are the Kudumbi community. So this is, uh, this is still a touchable uh, community, but they are in the middle of this huge fight in, in Kerala basically to get reservation status, so either to be, they, they couldn't get a uh, scheduled cast trap status because they had touchable relations with the, the other two communities that I've talked about, but they're working on getting scheduled tribe status, but it's impossible for them to do that because of the problem of they're not considered indigenous because they're mobile. So even though they are a group that have been historically harmed by slavery and by uh, the current legal structure does not actually recognize um, and they're deeply marginalized economically and educationally. Um, and so part of the research that I'm trying to do is to show that we, if we center slavery, you can start to actually see these kinds of problems. Um, okay, if we go further. Um, and, and they also have like their own ways uh, sort of religiously of maintaining these connections. So the Malikarjuna temple in Goa is hugely important in Porta. It's associated with their caste um, and, and they have one and they do this, you know, but the, the styles of worship are radically different. Like so the Kerala one looks like Kerala worship and then the Goa one looks like nothing like that, right? So yeah, if you go further. Um, so part of the problem, why, why can't we see these connections, right? Like when I say that, like I'm doing the Konkan and then everybody's like, well, why are you in Kochi? And I'm like, well, there's this weird historiographical exception that happened with Goa because of it was taken over by the Portuguese, because it was taken over by the Catholics. Um, there's a Catholic duality. And I'm trying to say that if we look at it in terms of political boundaries, we're going to miss the actual social history completely, right? Um, so if you go further. Um, so far from being that, actually Goa continues to be the linchpin even after the Portuguese takeover. Right? So that, there's a continuity there, and that's important in kind of understanding the networks um, through which both people were enslaved, but also how enslaved people moved in and out of slavery. Okay. So this is really at the heart of this. Like, how do we stop seeing like a state in a way like to use James Scott's idea? Like, how do we actually sort of see the difference between elite projects of enforcing boundaries, both spatial as well as social, right? Um, in terms of the sense of consciously articulated and police structures of identities and the ways in which subaltern subjects, particularly enslaved peoples, negotiated these projects. So slavery in the Konkan. Um, one of the things that I really want to, like I want to make some general observations and then I want to basically put out a call for help because the archives are so big and it's so enormous and it's just, we, we need to have the kind of collaborative research models that has made Atlantic historiography so rich happening in South Asia, right? So some general observations from the work that I've done. So early modern slavery, and this has been backed up also by other research, like the, the Dutch school that I mentioned in, 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 in the Netherlands that's doing this work, and then Bila Mukherjee's work in the Bay of Bengal has shown this to be true. So even though early modern slavery certainly expanded with the presence of European networks, but it was also due to increasing local demand for forced labor. And it was because it was cheaper and labor conditions were undoubtedly worse, um, and you, for enslaved people. 
Um, and so I have a great example of like, you know, uh, Francis Xavier, the, the saint, gives his advice to um, to his, his, you know, the guy who's kind of running the Jesuit college. And he says, you know, why don't you buy two Manatu, which is a washerman's um, uh, cast? He said, buy two of them. It'll be much cheaper in the long run than sending out a laundry. Um, so it's interesting because of what it suggests, of course, is that actually um, enslaved labor here is cheaper than caste-based labor. Um, and, and so the incentive is actually to actually go with, uh, so, uh, with, uh, with the enslaved person in this case. Um, and so the other thing is that while state and elite institutions, and I'm going to focus especially on the church as a kind of elite institution that was key to in the institutionalization of slavery, Private trading was rife, um, and this was both Europeans and South Asians. In fact, one of the groups that become key to the later country trade are precisely the Brahmins that I mentioned, the Konkani Brahmins, um, who are, become incredibly involved in, in enslavement um, in, um, in, in the trade. So while wealthy families and, and institutions enslavement, so even though it's not a plantation economy, Places like Goa and Kochi held slaves on really large scales, right? Like the convents, like you could have up to 300, you know, 400 people in some of these institutions as um, 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 uh, owning enslaved people. Most slaves outside these hubs, however, were sort of domestic slaves in small household settings. And we really have to take those into consideration and think about them together. So along the Konkan coast, the, from the different databases, which I'll talk about, the vast majority of slaves are South Asian and they're largely being raided from both fishing communities as well as from the hinterlands of the coast and this is kind of geographical outsiders but they were also be and they're so they're being trafficked through this coastal country trade but after the development of the Portuguese slaving hub in Bengal you're getting increasing numbers of people from the Bay of Bengal and Southeast Asia that are coming through there um, and that that trade has been really well in analyzed by Rila Mukherjee the oceanic trade across the Indian Ocean also um, carried South Asians far away. And so part of what I'm trying to do is also look at where all South Asians end up, right? Um, Africans are also coming. The trade in Africans, uh, African people is, is old in South Asia. So, but prior to the involvement of the Portuguese, it was really focused on the Horn of Africa and the Arab and Gujarati merchants in the Northwestern um, um, Indian Ocean. But after the involvement of the Portuguese, that actually shifts. So even the, the, the ethnicity of people who are coming, so it's clear that over time, the, m many of the Africans who are coming to, uh, to this coast are not coming from the Horn. Um, they're actually coming from areas of Mozambique. So we, so we would actually need the kind of investment in African uh, studies that we've seen in Brazil to even begin to figure out the ethnicities, the histories of the people who are being brought from Africa. Um, and also Southeast Asians. So there's evidence, for example, that Javanese people were highly valued as church painters, um, and they show up all over the place as as um, as really coveted um, 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 slaves to do this kind of work. So if you can go forward, uh, this is this this uh, the the labor condition stuff is also there's anecdotal things. So I like this example. I mean, it's horrible, right? Because it's being given as a miracle <laughs> by this Franciscan writer. But what is he saying? He's describing the building of this major church, and he and he basically shows that actually you know so big eating is is debt bonded um, or 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 forced labor under some kind of obligation. Um, and the master bricklayer tells him to do something clearly so dangerous that he's probably going to die. And the fact that he doesn't die is then reported as a miracle. But for me, what's really interesting is, of course, it gives us a sense of the kind of conditions under which enslaved people worked. Right. Um, and, and then there's all this visual evidence, which actually, I mean, some of it has been really helpful for me, but I'm not an art historian. So this is when I say, like, well, we really need, <laughs> we really need help to, like, do this kind of work. So if we go forward. Okay, so uh, like I said, one of the sort of exemplary um, elite institutions for thinking about the institutionalization of slavery, and the one that I focused on because of my own expertise and the kind of work that I've done before, is the church. And the church, as we've seen, was really concerned with the question of slaves. Um, and, but 
but they also were totally involved with it, as we will see. Um, and so this this is uh, the Jesuit fellow um, Boaventura. He writes for, to uh, from Kochi, and he basically gives this long sort of theological disquisition. He's saying we're not taking just the enslaved people. There's no just war here. But we're, 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 I mean, look at the number. And sometimes with some Malabarish, there happened to be in Goa 40,000 slaves um, from Kerala. And in our college alone, 40, which I, which I can actually confirm because we have lists of, um, uh, of, of people, uh, personnel from the college, of which is true that a 20th part of them were taken against divine and human law. And despite them, these, we treat them worse than slaves. So there's a lot of sort of what would be considered illicit trafficking and enslavement happening according to the church as well, but they're still doing it, right? Okay. So as I said, <laughs> I am drinking from a fire hose. <laughs> like, there's so much material. I mean, right now I'm like, I'm compiling data on climate, like on rainfall to see if we can figure out like what what pricing and how how the labor market structure might have worked so this really needs collaborative work but what i want to do is to give you just a sense of how much there is so um i've created some databases which i'll talk about and there are problems with each of them but they give us different kinds of pictures right of, of these kinds of things um and then we i mentioned some of the kind of anecdotal research uh, evidence that i have and then we'll talk about legal and diplomatic correspondence as well So one thing um, that actually has been well studied is this very interesting codex of manumitted people from the late 17th century. I built my own database out of it, just focusing on the um, 17th century. There are a few records from the later, um, later like 18th century, but they're much fewer. So for for reasons of sort of analytical codency and like just having a large enough N, it made sense to kind of cut off the my own database at that 1700 mark. Um, what's really interesting, and this is, um, the, you know, the Teotoni de Sosa and Patricia Faria de Sosa have actually written about this. Um, um, but what's really interesting to me is that the thing that tripped them up was this, was, this, was, this, was the fact that half of the people in this group are identified as Gatwal. And Teotoni de Sosa was trying to basically say it must be some kind of caste, and he's like, it can't be, it must be different from Balaga. But um, they, they must be like another way of saying Malaga or something like that. But they, they didn't really have an answer. And I think I have an answer to this question. Um, before I get to that, I want to point out um, that, you know, the largest upper caste group in this in this group is um, Shardos, which are like sort of Kshatriyas. Um, and there are 70 of them. There were no Brahmins. Um, that seems important. Um, and also the construction of blackness is not confined to Africans. So people, you know, who are identified as Gatual or, or Kudumbi are also being called Negrinha or something like that, right? What I want to actually point to is that what, what you're seeing to make sense of this is like they're overlapping bureaucratic strategies to mark people as outsiders. So you could be a geographical outsider like this Gatual category, um, or you could be uh, an outsider because of blackness. I think the blackness actually is often indexed to not Africanness, but to actually um, to what 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 now translates into quote unquote scheduled tribes in India, right? Um, so so there's a really fascinating record that I uh, account of an early foray into um, pro this this predates the early the the, the sort of understood uh, European contact with the Dora peoples of the Nilgiri Hills um, by at least a century. Um, and so it's a, it's a Portuguese um, missionary who kind of makes his way from um, Kerala up the hills and then eventually makes contact with the Dora. Um, and my guess is that Gat Gatwal is actually coming from that side of the hills that separate the Golden Coast from the, from the Deccan. So, the, so, so it's not Balaghati, which was like sort of the the, the 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 mountains people, but on the foothills. But these are actually like coming from those passes and things. Um, so, geographical outsiders, blackness, caste, race—these are all sort of being. There's a weird bureaucratic melange going on 
But what this is, is to actually do exactly what so, uh, so, uh, Swadesh talks about, right? It's the, it's the liminal incorporation, but also it's the dynamism of this process of marking people as outsiders in order to enslave them. Right. So here, this is part of the way that I think that you can see Balaghat is being, uh, has been identified in this ma map as being on the other side of those mountains. And so Gatwal would actually be from this side of the mountains. Um, and Ghati even today has very pejorative terms associated also with blackness and coming from these kind of um, hinterlands of the, of the Konkan coast. So it's still used in Goa and, um, and, and it's understood in this way. So another set of records that I looked at was the Inquisition records. Um, and so specifically the amazing work of Bruno Feitler and his group to actually, um, to actually you know, create that database of the Hippodio, which, which has all of the, um, which was the only account we have of all of the different people who went through the Inquisition. And I built my own database, basically looking at people who either were enslaved in or, uh, or came from the West Coast and as a way to kind of understand and think about mobility. Um, and so off the records that I constructed, you know, so the, the group that I would consider as being enslaved, so even the Foro, the Captivo, and the Ishkabu, um, that you can see the numbers in total. And you can see actually like, um, that mo actually most people end up being where they are, right? So they're being enslaved along the coast and they end up staying for the most part along the coast, but there's a lot of mobility as well. People are being, Know, taken back and forth um and and there's a lot more work too and then there's a lot more analysis that came out of this that that it's you know that is interesting but we don't have time to get into all of this <laughs> we move forward uh the other set of records that i looked at so there are two really interesting sets of extant parish records um that are really early so the first one is a codex of ma um, uh, baptismal records from the village of Lotling. It's in horrific condition. And I managed to basically, after the first four months, I had to go transcribe by hand. So you can imagine how slow that was. So I couldn't, I couldn't finish all of it. Um, I've, I've done about, you know, I've, I've done, I think, the vast chunk of everything from the 17th century. But that's why I must be you know, careful. All of my analysis is really, we have to think of it as a sampling of this whole codex, because it will, I'll have to go back and continue to transcribe this really, really poorly um, you know, uh, preserved thing. But already something really interesting has emerged from this analysis. So one is that prior to this map, mass baptismal event of Brahmins in 1615, pretty much all of the people who were ba getting baptized were actually what we would consider lower caste. Once the baptismal, the baptism of this, this Brahmins, and this, this was a mass baptism of several Brahmin families that didn't even happen in the village, it happened in Goa. So this was like a fancy event, right? And then you started to see a real shift. And over the course, by the end of the 17th century, you're not seeing the records of that many lower caste people being baptized as much. And I'm guessing that's just because people were just not registering their, their baptisms <laughs> in, in the same numbers anymore, right? Um, but they're well integrated into everyday life. So the Malabari slave Francisca, who belonged to the Sudinu was baptized and her grandfather was, you know, listed. So you can already see that this is a Kerala slave, um, um, a, Kerala, a person from Kerala who's been enslaved, who's in a little town in Goa, um, but is being, you know, like is being integrated into real, into, uh, into life there. Um, Slaves could even serve as um, as godparents. So what happened is that it seems like the Catholic, um, uh, you know, godparenthood actually allowed new forms of kinship to be kinship ties to be created that otherwise, you know, endogamy and rules around caste would not have allowed. So it's really interesting to see that. And you can see a lot of social mobility, especially with the group that were called Chaudhrys, um, who were technically Shudra, but because they were a scribal cat, Past, they were actually had the widest range of social ties from enslaved, you know, they had um, enslaved people as godparents, but also Brahmins and, and landlords, the Gankars. Um, 
one of the kind of saddest parts for me was to actually see like illegitimate um, slave or children women with illegitimate children whose baptism was often sponsored by powerful village landlords um, and suggesting the sort of nature of sexual slavery in these records. Um, and and so it, it's it's a very suggestive database for looking at what social life in these in these towns would in these little villages would have been like. Can we go to the next one? Similarly, the, uh, this one I did manage to do, transcribe the whole thing. This is a set of um, um, marriage records. These are the earliest marriage records we have in Goa um, from 1605 to 1622 in the village of Sambak And again, um, what's interesting is that, you know, there were, it's a very small sample of people who were uh, in, involved in involving current or former slaves which probably suggests that more the rarity of formalized marriage because from the Lutlim records we actually have a sense of just how actually there there's a big proportion of village people who are in state, right? Um, and actually I do have some demographic numbers thanks to Bocaro's Libre de Spantes, which I've also um, you know compiled for for understanding like the proportion of enslaved people around in in, in towns along the Kongan. Um, and, and but one of the things that really comes out of the marriage records is the kind of slippery line between poverty, lower caste status, formal enslaved status, and these and other forms of dependency, including orphanhood. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's evidence already that like they weren't, you know, that that having converted does not actually change the fact that that caste segregation was still happening. So the orphan Anna, who married the Lorenzo Farage, who would be Mahar, um, uh, were resident in, in, in the house for Mahars beside the church, as it was as it was put in the in the in the uh, in the marriage record. Right. So if we go forward. Okay, so we talked a little bit about mobility already. So, and I, and I want to emphasize that definitely mobility was key to, you know, it was a conduit into slavery. I mean, there's tons of raiding that's happening, right? As Pedro Boaventura said, like this is, these are not war captives. These are basically being, you know, raided. And there's a kidnapping that happens. So this really fascinating record that's sent from uh, the Savan Fadi court to the Portuguese um, secretary of the Estado, um, he basically says, oh, you know, somebody somebody um, kidnapped the wife of one of the, our court officials. Um, and this is a fascinating record for a lot of reasons. So Linga Delvi, Del, Delvis were becoming quite a powerful caste within the Maratha military um, state. Um, and and so they, they were quite powerful. And so that's part of the reason why he could sort of intervene and get his wife back. His wife, by the way, looks like she was about 11 from the record. Um, and she's, um, you know, and that she's been kidnapped and then she's basically sold to this woman, Rangana Kalavant. Kalavant is, a, is a, actually a cast of, um, of a, it's a performing cast of women alone. And, and in fact, uh, Kalavant basically says, uh, you know, you can have her back, just give me back the price that was paid for her. So it's a really fascinating record for a lot of reasons, right? So if we go forward, and of course the entire thing for, for the Portuguese, they have many they have many systems in place to really curtail and think about mobility. The most important is is the cartaz, right? This is the entire basis for the um, for the Portuguese economy and the state is to basically control access into and from the Indian Ocean. This is a typical cartaz, right? These sea pa passes that are given. This one was issued to the Sultan of Ahmednagar for his own ship to travel to Ormuz and Malacca from Shaul. So it also suggests like the linkages of indigenous polities to all these different places in the Indian Ocean. Um, but what's interesting is that one of the things that it, the Kartaj makes clear is that you cannot carry people, especially slaves. <laughs> so they're very much trying to curtail the movement of people, right? If you go forward. 
Um, there, I looked at these market regulations that were done in the Senate of Goa in like the early 16, um, 17th century. And again, there's lots of things. So this one is really interesting because it gives a sense of the life of enslaved people in, in Goa. And they clearly had, you know, they were out about in the town. They were running their own shops. They were clearly getting drunk. <laughs> like, um, and, and so there's, there's a rich kind of social history there. But what's much more interesting to me from the mobility point of view is this one, which basically uh said that you know like um that uh that fishermen and boatmen had to pay a bond um so that because so many people were running away um, um and and going into the neighboring territory with money stolen objects and weapons which is fascinating too okay if we go forward um in fact, it's not just that they were running away from the Portuguese. It's really important to remember that the movement was happening both in both directions. So because it was a short-lived legal provision that allowed Christian converts to claim the status of freedmen, um, that one actually was formally rescinded in 1559. But if you look at Inquisition records, um, like, like the one I did with um, uh, of, that was published in Past and Present, the memory of this sort of remain for a long time. And so this idea remained for a long time, even in the interior, that if you could make it to Goa, you'd be freed. Um, and so people were still coming back in the other direction too, right? So if you go forward. Um, what's fascinating is that these states were cooperating with each other to control and police slavery. So the diplomatic correspondence is really key to understanding this. This one is, you know, this is sent from the Sarsubedar of, of Ponda under the Sunda kings, and he writes in Marathi to the Portuguese state. And he basically said, it, it's about um, the Portuguese have demanded that two runaway slaves are copy. And this is again, really interesting because from the Marathi records, um, and I've looked at the Peshwa Daftar and things like blackness is also being used by indigenous courts um, as a way to do the same sort of thing of marking people as outsiders and therefore that is why they're being enslaved, right? The, 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 the same like kind of logic is being used on the other side, right? Um, and he says, uh, it's, uh, he uses the word, the word used here is copy, which I'm, I'm guessing means, um, um, is, is, is really trying to refer to Africans because they're using different words um, when they're referring to, um, like in the Maratha, Maratha, Maratha Delta records that I've looked at, blackness is being marked in other ways. Um, and copy is not necessarily always being used. So I'm guessing this is actually African slaves in this situation, but there's confusion there. Um, so when they were found, um, they actually said that they were owned by uh, this guy Francis, and he uh, he had I'm guessing he was a lashkar or some kind of sea merchant, and so he boarded a ship and gave them a paper. Basically, uh, the word in Marathi is that giving that allowing them to find a job to fill their stomachs wherever they could, <laughs> um, and so but it's not quite formal manumission. So the Sunda official essentially hands them back to the Portuguese. Um, and so we have lots of other um, examples like this, if you go across. Um, this one is heartbreaking because this was about a mother who actually sold her child and now is trying to use the, the Portuguese courts to actually get her child back. But the court here is basically saying, we bought her, we're not going to give the child back. So here you can see how the state is directly involved in enslavement itself right that it is buying slaves um directly okay yeah here can we go forward um and the part of the thing that's emerged from this you know the hubshi and sort of mainstream south asian historiography the the has already because the source space is usually persian chronicles they there's a huge tendency to think of them as really like, you know, elite mili military slavery. And so people like Malik Umbar is sort of the classic idea of the Habshi. And that is of course true. Like that is, there's no doubt, right? That African uh, people who are being brought as military slaves in the Islamic system do end up in these positions of great power. If we go further. Um, this is another example of the um, Sid, the, Sid, the royal family that only, uh, of Chanjira who only seceded um, to the Indian Union after the British left. So if we go forward. But um, 
if we look at the Portuguese records, this is clearly not an adequate picture of the number of Africans who were there. Right? So I've written about this guy, this Ethiopian man, Gabriel, in past and present, if you go forward. Um, but there are intriguing records. I mean, here you can see the ways in which Gabriel's life moved around, right? Like he was such a, such a rich and, <laughs> and mobile life, right? Um, and it would require a real understanding of, you know, of, of, of Africa for South Asian as to begin to sort of understand these kinds of lives, right? I mean, in the records, I've seen things like Mozimba and, you know, there, we need South Asianists to actually start to understand African history in the same way that Brazilian history, historians have invested in that, right? We go forward. Um, and, and this was happening. So this, this particular king in Kochi, he, he is Chakan Tampuran was famous for, you know, really, really valuing African slaves. In particular, this is a data sale for an 11 year old boy. Um, and he actually compelled the incoming Dutch governor of Malabar to give five of his slaves to him as a gift. And the governor was actually uh, said that there was great pain in the household because of the affection they had for the slaves. If you go forward. So the slaves are being used as diplomatic gifts as well between these states, right? Um, so, if, uh, as I mentioned, like you know, um, when we while, while we really have to we really have to start to think about ethnicity of of of, of people who are coming as enslaved people into Africa, and we have no way of doing that. And, and you know, there's beginning to have some work, but we need real investment in this. Okay, sorry if you go forward, almost done. <laughs> and you can see the legacies of this up and down the coast. So there are these Capri. Um, Devatas. Um, so this is Kapreshwar Mandir in Malwan in Maharashtra. This one is in Karnataka. There are a couple that I've been to in Goa. There's the Kapri Motapan in, uh, in Matancheri in Kerala. And these are literally, I think, the, like, you know, the memories of, of enslaved Africans who become gods. And so you go there with tobacco and alcohol in much the same way that you would go to these Rakhandars and, and Goa. Like they're, they're this class of deities of power and, and of local protection um, that, you know, that are appropriated. I, I love the communist hammer and sickle next to the Kapimotofans <laughs> in Kerala, which is great. <laughs> okay, we go forward. Um, so where do I want to end? I mean, uh, I just, you know, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot more to kind of think through. But for me, it's this landscape that really demands historicization and which requires to attend the long history of slavery in South Asia. It's a living reminder of the complicated trajectories of enslaved people. Um, and, and really what it does is that it forces us to think about the difference between elite projects of boundary making, um, whether it's spatial, right, between po political um, uh, entities or, or social in the sense of, you know, why is the Inquisition so invested in saying if you're, if you're a Christian or a Muslim, right? So the number of Inquisition records of enslaved people where there's like, oh no, I'm not really a Muslim. Oh, I might be a Muslim. And a lot of it seems to be about, you know, sort of trying to negotiate freedom. Um, and so, um, so what we so we really cannot take these classificatory labels imposed upon enslaved people by elite institutions uh, for granted. We have to a social history of the region elucidates instead the evolution of these elite mechanisms for policing identity and the centrality of expropriating labor involved in such processes of classification. Right? As Barbara Fields says in her analysis of race, racecraft, we must resist the naturalization of such categories when they serve to obfuscate the consolidation of power and resources and expropriation of labor without losing sight of the importance of the ongoing production of such categories as part of the exercise of power, right? Finally, this is happening now. I'm in San Francisco. This is a, there's a massive case right now about sort of casteism in the workplace in Cisco. In Cisco. Um, and and uh, a lot of uh, Hindu American groups, um, like Kona, have basically uh, sided on the side of, you know, these casteist people um, to, to basically say the caste does not exist. Um, so if you look forward, like this is the Kona definition of caste. Um, right. And you'll see 
Uh, at its core, it's a cast uh, stereotypically portrayed by Western media and some genres of um, things. Cast itself is an English derivation of a Portuguese word not found in any of India's many native languages. The only thing those papers done, because I hope it shows what nonsense this, this line is. Okay, I'll stop here. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ananya, for this uh, very interesting presentation and very intriguing work on progress. Uh, so now I'm opening the floor for questions. So anyone who wants to pose a question can use the raise hand function or type the question in the chat, please. So Gabriel, please. Needed to open the mic. Uh, I mean, very. I mean, amazing. Very interesting presentation. I don't. My voice is clear. Uh, just okay. Because uh, I don't have the feedback. I don't know. Um, I mean, I, it's amazing work, and I think it's uh, really fascinating. Uh, really, I thank you for your presentation. My I, my line of subjects sort of intersects a little bit with yours. I mean, in a great way, possibly, but now from what I'm seeing, there is a difference. I study mainly the relationship between Portuguese and Muslims in the Western Indian Ocean in general. Mm -hmm. So I study mainly from the Arab sources. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's a very interesting thing because you were talking about the, the sort of connections and parallels we can see with the Atlantic slave history. But when I deal with this subject, what, what I'm actually drawn to is the parallels between the Mediterranean history and the Mediterranean relationships between uh, Muslim groups and states and Christian uh, entities and states. And also in regards to slavery, mostly I what I've seen, and, and there was some, some slips of it in your presentation. And I was like, oh yeah, I'm really wondering about that. It's because of the, usually because of war and, and usually related to captivity and usually with works in ships and things like that. That's where I mostly see this uh, situation. Uh, uh, it, it's hard to tell, I mean, the scale or whatever, but I don't know if you have encountered that from your research that the relationship between. I think you're hundred percent right. Like, I mean, the thing is, like, because this is exactly what I mean. That what this kind of work would require is large scale collaboration, right? I don't read Persian. I actually, I think part of the reason that, like, you know, especially like my work on African um, African peoples is so different from the sort of prevailing view of Africans and the South Asian historiography is because I'm not working out of Persian materials which is really where that image of like elite military slavery as being the sort of paradigmatic way of thinking about Africans in South Asia has, has developed from, right? The question then becomes like, if, you know, I mean, what would happen to the model that I'm proposing here if you really started to get into not elite court chronicles or that kind of thing, but I'm talking about like, sort of like, you know, um, the, 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 um, the port records, you know, like the, the customs records, like that kind of thing, right? This is really where a lot of the work needs to happen. Like, I mean, I for myself, I mean, this is three years of work, right? Like um, in various archives, I haven't even been to Lisbon yet. So I haven't even touched the work that I could do in Lisbon. So you can, you can imagine I haven't been to Rome, right? And those were the two places like I'm, I know I have to go. I have to go, for example, to the British Library. Like we're talking about like just the sheer scale of trying to if, think through this problem. And in fact, that's precisely what I'm trying to suggest is that if we centralize slavery, which I think we really must, I mean, the political necessity of centralizing slavery in South Asia is is ridiculous, right? I mean, we have the largest number of enslaved people today, and we don't talk about slavery, right? Um, and so, so in that sense, then this really requires the kind of large scale, collaborative, ongoing work that has happened in the Atlantic world. It can't just be a little soft field where people are writing a few things. It requires just a paradigm shift. Uh, I, I agree. I agree. And I think there are many layers and types of it. And I think 
in that context, like in the Indian Ocean context, uh, you, you, I think the there is more of a boundary when you talk about um, uh, the slavery in the Atlantic and the one that we see in the Mediterranean area. While I think there's more overlapping when it talks about South Asia, and you have and many entities, many types of um, states and policies and entities. That's, and there's I think more of an overlap in types of... Honestly, places. that's one of the biggest difference, right? I mean, if you're working with Brazil, you're dealing largely, right? Not entirely, but largely with a few states. Here, you're dealing with many, 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 many different states, right? And you're dealing then also not just with many states, but as I said, elite institutional uh, um, um, actors that are part of this process of institutionalization, right? I only focus on the church. Uh, people, if you started to look at, for example, caste councils, right? This is where a lot of this stuff is happening too, right? You'd have to involve all of that in thinking about this problem. Yes, very interesting. Uh, we have two questions. Uh, one is coming from the chat and also Hoshali is, is raising her hand. So I'm going to uh, allow Hoshali to speak first, but then uh, I'm going to read the, the question in the chat. Uh, th thanks. Thanks for uh, allowing me to go first. And Anya, that was uh, fascinating and, you know, it's a real pleasure and uh, a privilege to sort of hear uh, all of your research sort of come together. I. I, I guess I have very obvious questions. One is I've, uh, all, you know, I'm, I'm interested in how race gets hidden by caste or where the slippage happens. So, you know, by um, by sort of talking about it as the formation of outsiders, uh, you know, in one in a sense you've you've addressed that. But I guess you also probably suspect that there are ways in which slaves probably slipped into caste categories and, and slipped out of them. And I was wondering if you had any hunch about how That's that happens. That's where and the marriage records and the Inquisition records right. are key. There is so much cross marriage happening. And like, you know, the, the whole nonsense of endogamy just completely falls apart when you think about it that way, because there is so much cross ethnic marriage happening, right? And all of the, I can I have just example after example after example of this kind of thing happening, and then I'm guessing that over time all of these people just get absorbed into different castes, and and mm -hmm. and you know like uh, that uh, um, certainly with with Afro Asiatic po populations we know this happened like the you know, the cities now are essentially a scheduled tribe like this has happened like but you know. And many of them actually, I doubt that they're really thinking about their roots back in Zambia necessarily, right? Like, I mean, like yeah. all of these kinds of things are, it's not really like it, it we really must move away from taking yeah. the, these, these, these things as reality, right? Just focus on the, the actually the emphasis on endogamy is happening at the elite level. Right. Um, endogamy is being violated everywhere. But that doesn't mean that caste is not continuing to be an extremely important way of institutionalizing slavery. Right, yeah. I was also, you know, just, you know, whenever I'm asked about why race doesn't appear, say, in a South Asian context, and I sort of have to explain that it's not a social category through which difference or dissent is articulated, except maybe in the Northeast, you know, where you're forced, they're forced to respond to uh, the category of race, you know, because of mainland India and, and but the I think that in... the geographical outsiders, right, the Gatua category is a racialized category. Yeah, but the other thing I was thinking of, you know, and this is where, where you talk about the anthropological sort of potential of your work, is that in Goa, it's true that people would be happy to claim whiteness. And it was, in fact, technically and legally, uh, it, it was in the census, right? Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, and you, you have categories like Mestisu and that, that it continues to exist in public memory, but strangely, uh, blackness is never admitted in. Uh, no, and, and, and where fact, you sort of acknowledge. Blackness continues to be one of the ways in which you mark outsider. I mean, the, when I was doing my research, yeah. like so in Chopre, the little village where I've documented the forced labor, there's a fascinating self-organized rural collective of women that actually cook for all the temples in the area. Um, not just that one, but like right. in the entire area. 
these are mostly Brahmins. They have one woman who is, a, and one of the Brahmin women actually came, kind of came to me and said, Professor, she's a ghati, you know, she's very clean. Yeah. She's from, she's from Karnataka. And she's basically, like, you know, she's just a dark skinned migrant. And, you know, she's, and I, I talked to her about the village she's from, and the deity that she worships. And, you know, she talked about, you know, how she goes back for Renuka and things like that. It's it's that. It's really about continuing to mark those things. And if you say that race doesn't exist in South Asia, I mean, that's ridiculous. Of course it does. Yeah. But all of this stuff starts, right? I mean, so the group, the Kurumbis, who I actually gave them the records that I found in the Goa archives of their of their people as being enslaved because they are fighting for some kind of reservation. Now, the truth is that the way that they're doing it is by trying to you know, create caste genealogies so that they can get scheduled tribe status. Because unfortunately, the way that, you know, indigeneity is constructed in the law means that migrants, including migrants that have been there for 400 years, have no way of seeking redress in the law for historical harm. Yeah. I had I had a linked question, if I may, if I if I could just ask it, which is just a hunch that I had about, um, you know, one thing that I always contend with historiographically is this idea that the Portuguese didn't have a stable state, and by implication, that often becomes a sort of backdoor method to say, well, power was weak, you know, or colonial power was weak because there wasn't a centralized. Uh, but the fact is that you know, even what's termed as innovation. There is something um, flexible, but but systematic in a way, or not systematic, but consistent about the ability to include and exclude. And I was wondering if there's also a kind of political tradition to be talked about there, whether it's something that's Catholic or Aristotelian yeah. or... I love that you asked a question that you should answer. <laughs> like, it's, 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 it's far outside of my wheelhouse. I'm just not a... I'm not an intellectual historian. <laughs> like I think it's true. I think what I'm more intrigued by is the ways in which these different states are clearly borrowing strategies from each other yeah. and cooperating. Yeah. Right? I think that to me is really fascinating. Right? That they're using yeah. bureaucratic strategies and that there's a real kind of um, knowledge transfer that's happening. That that that. I can see that as a social historian. I, I'm really not an intellectualist. Somebody else, okay. somebody else need to do that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that also needs a sort of worldwide collaboration. So, but thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm going to read a question of uh, Swati Moitra. I apologize if I mispronounced uh, her name. Uh, well, she said that uh, she's curious about the role of the Hindu caste elite in slavery in the Konkan Malabar coasts. The Bengal coast, for instance, had different dynamics, which you've alluded to, uh, which would have included so-called upper caste men and women, along the enslaved. Absolutely. I mean, so I've, I've just started to work on some of the Bengali materials, and I have to say, I, I feel very, very uncomfortable doing it because it's not really my wheelhouse. But it's clear, like the dynamics in Bengal are completely different because the ubiquity of enslavement um, of, of coastal populations is such that actually, hundred percent, like many of the Bengalas, Bengalis that are ended up ending up in the Konkan coast are not all lower caste. In fact, I think, I suspect that the reason why they're always actually marked as Bengala is because caste cannot be used as a way to generate outsider status. Because I'm guessing many of them are upper caste, right? So you you just use Bengala and that becomes the way. They're marked as geographical outsiders um, in, in the Golden area, right? Um, so absolutely, like what you're talking about is is very different. And what's interesting in in the in terms of upper caste in the Konkan area, this is where my work on the the Konkani um, Brahmin community is so important, right? Not only do they eventually, I mean, the community that was in Kochi, um, um, you know, they're they're spread all over the coast, by the way, right? And they really reconstitute themselves in the Kochi area, especially as traders so they so they leave because there must have been like land owning peoples and they leave because they can't hold on to the land because of changing Portuguese law and the British convert and they really reconstitute themselves both religiously they become very strongly Vaishnav which is much more uh, important in the south um, than it was in Gaul which was more Shaivite but they also become really a trading caste in the same way that the Jetians are 
Um, and over time, they're so important, right? Because there's always a crisis in, Port in Goa of having enough rice. They, they, they are very important rice traders. So eventually, by the end of the 18th century, they're allowed to come back. Many of them do. Um, and, and they are actually also really important traders in, in slavery, including in the African slave trade. But also these class dynamics matter because part of it, I think that this all this reconstitution that's happening of the upper caste is because the intrusion of the Portuguese actually does create a crisis of Brahminism up and down the coast. So in, in the Deccan, the, you know, the work that, you know, uh, that, um, oh God, that other scholars like, I can't believe I'm back, like Polly O'Hanlon, Polly O'Hanlon's brilliant work on the fact that like, you know, the Shanvi Brahmins have to be protected by the Maratha state because essentially they're being, they're being out, they're being excommunicated by the Brahmins in the Deccan because of their kinship ties with Brahmins who convert in Goa, right? So this sets off this huge crisis of Brahminism for, but in Goa, the Catholic Brahmins then reconstitute themselves as an extremely powerful caste. And so the work that I've done with, you know, like Catholic Brahmins, including the first bishop, Mateus de Castro, I mean, he's basically saying, hey, we should just be Brahmins. <laughs> like, I mean, in some, in some sense, like that's what's going on here. Thank you, Professor. Uh, do you, anyone has any other question to, to make, uh, either by the chat or raising the hand? While you are thinking, uh, I have a question myself. I don't know if, if it's really uh, something that you already uh, look into, because as, as you mentioned, uh, Ananya, you, it, it's a, you have so much material that you, could, you need a collaborative work. But as you said that slavery was sometimes um, connected to the issue of um, dealing with uh, famine and with some problems with, with hunger and how people would enslave family members because of that. And I was thinking about uh, climate issues. If you uh, had the opportunity to uh, search anything on, on this sense that how climate also um, stimulated Absolutely. this kind of behavior, especially right now that we are living this such a crisis. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. And I actually think that, like, you know, the current enslavement and caste politics are also responding to environmental pressures right now in India. Absolutely. I mean, what's what's really I mean, the whole the whole need for, you know, um, expanding reservation for um, many agricultural communities that before were quite powerful um, is precisely because, like, you know, agricultural even even being landowners now is not a really good hedge, right? Like if you you need like another way of having an access to the state is one of the things like, you know, like the agitation among hotels and other other groups who, are, who really do need help because even, even if you're a powerful um, land owning community now, that's not a guaranteed access to, to continuing prosperity, right? Um, so I think these things are absolutely happening, even as we speak. But in the in the historical context, I mean, I'm quite literally, right now, I'm trying to like um, tabulate and collect um, rainfall data, um, and and actually to use the Maratha Daftar um, records and things to actually see if I can like find that price um, um, data for for enslaved people, and then connect it through that, you know, to see like if if I can find like correlations between. Um, changing um, climatic conditions and then prices of slaves and supplies of slaves. Like, I mean, like I said, I can't do this by myself. Like, this, this, reads, this needs a whole, whole, the whole field to really centralize slave, slavery. And we should. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it's a very um, promising field, I guess, that if, if we consider all of this issues that we could analyze in all the archives. It's really uh, a, a great work to do. Well, uh, does anyone have any other question? We have a, just a few minutes. So if anyone uh, wants to uh, add anything or comment anything, I will uh, end the session, but I'll please, please feel free to, to do so right now. We have a few minutes. <laughs> 
I realized that this was really overwhelming presentation in some ways. Like it's just there's so much stuff. And and what I just want to emphasize is that there's so much more. <laughs> like and I, I it took me so long to even put anything coherent together because it's just the sheer amount of material that I am that I was trying to make sense of. Hashal, please. Yeah, Ananya, I just remember that Antonio Almeida, who teaches in Nantes and at the University of Nantes, he actually has also been putting together a database of slaves. And he, in fact, showed me that, you know, there were all these, uh, that, that there were slaves from Goa, uh -huh. um, you know, who, who were, yeah. and I just realized that would be <laughs> one person to yeah, collaborate yeah. with. <laughs> That's all. Yeah. Yeah. But really, I think, you know, what the connection that Gabrielle made, like, you know, what we really need is to find a coherent way to, like, connect, like, sort of the Meraki records. Like, for example, I can't read Malayalam. And so I couldn't really get into the records of Malayalam in the Kochi uh, archives, um, which is a huge shame, right? So, but, but again, there's just so many languages that are also involved in trying to do this because there's so many different polities, because there's so many different but the probably the best bet in terms of where we could go next is to connect the work that's been done in Persian language materials to this kind of work that, that I'm trying to do. Well, um, thank you, Ananya. Uh, thank you for such a fascinating talk and uh, everyone who attended and then made questions and tried to collaborate. I think it's that's the, the idea of the seminar. So thank you uh, a lot. And I would also like to invite everyone to keep showing up and we are going to have another seminar session in two weeks on the 28th of September. We receive Marcela Miranda, a very dear friend, who is going to talk about the reason of state in this panic um, world. So you're all invited. Thank you so much. <laughs>